Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Welcome to Worship with Ramon Avenue Christian Church. I'm Dr. Matt, as always, and I want to welcome you to this time of worship, wonder, and prayer. I'm continuing the sermon series on uh, prayers through the Bible. So, uh, as we gather today, I want to remind us all that we will be taking communion later. So, if you have something to eat, something to drink, um, we'll partake together later in the service. And um, thinking about what's been going on in the world lately, and uh, just thinking back a bit, I want to go back to a practice that we were doing earlier um, during the height of the pandemic. Um, I want to lead you in a breath prayer. So uh, this is where we, we do some deep breaths, and we have a phrase that we say when we exhale. So um, today, given what's going on, especially in the, in the Holy Land, um, I want us to use the phrase, Lord, have mercy. Okay, so start with a couple of deep breaths. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Amen. Now let us continue our worship as we sing together the Lord's Prayer. Church, as we come to our time of prayer today, well, there's a lot going on <laughs> in the world, and, and you know that. And so uh, I, at the beginning of the service, I, I let us in that little breath prayer, the Lord have mercy. And this is an ancient prayer that goes back. This is a Kyrie eleison, if you've heard. That's the Latin. Um, and so you have, um, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. Um, this is an ancient prayer, and it really does speak well to our moment, the moment that we're in, because <clears throat> it speaks to the moment we're in because there are so many things going on in this world that you could despair over, so many things where we feel the need for mercy, for God's mercy. Um, so many people being killed in in the Holy Land, uh, well over 10,000 Palestinians now, and uh, close to 1,500 Israelis, um, just devastating. Um, and the calls for ceasefire become louder and louder. And by the time you, you watch this, there might even be one in place. Um, but we need to be praying for that situation, just the whole thing. Pray for the peace 
with justice of that of that region. Um, and of course, many other things continue, Ukraine and, and so on. Um, and we have folks among us who are recovering from illness or surgery, um, people who are celebrating remission from cancer and, and other things. And so we want to keep all in our prayers and say, Lord, have mercy. How are you today? And I'm going to invite you to think about how you're doing. I was part of a group years ago, and one of the things that we would do was, uh, in each meeting, you would take some time and say, when was one time when you felt close to Christ during the past week? And then, what is one time you felt furthest from Christ in the past week? So I want to invite you to pause the video and just take a minute or two and think about where did you feel close to Christ in this past week? Uh, and Mary, did you maybe feel further away? And now, with that fresh in our minds, let us go to our God in prayer. Lord, have mercy on us, poor sinners. We have failed you in so many ways. Individually, we have failed you, but also corporately as humans. We have failed. We have failed to care for your earth. We have failed to care for one another. We have failed to care for peace. We have failed to love. We have failed in our imagination for what is possible and what is right and good. Forgive us, Lord. Lord, have mercy. So many people are suffering and dying. Some are suffering mentally. Some are suffering physically. Some emotionally, some spiritually, some all of those at once. Lord, have mercy. But also, we rejoice with those who are rejoicing in, in good things, in new life, new possibilities, a renewed sense of hope and life. Christ, have mercy. Lord, lead us in your paths, in your ways of justice and righteousness, that we can be your light in this deeply troubled world. Lord, have mercy in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.
Good morning. Our scripture reading for today is from Luke 18 and from Revelation 22. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He wouldn't even lift his eyes to look toward heaven. Rather, he struck his chest and said, God, show mercy to me, a sinner. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. They drew lots as a way of dividing up his clothing. The one who bears witness to these things says, Yes, I'm coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. So, church, we're continuing this series on prayers in the Bible. And uh, this week I wanted to touch on uh, a couple of really short prayers, uh, because prayer does not have to be a production, right? When it boils down to it, prayer is really just communicating with God. And that can be short. And um, this was brought home to me years ago by uh, someone named uh, Victor Perichin, who uh, he was the interim pastor at the um, church I served uh, years ago. And uh, I was assistant pastor. He was the uh, interim in between senior pastors. And uh, one Sunday he said, help! And be a prayer. And I thought about it. And it's like, yeah, you're totally right. Help! can be a prayer. Help! And uh, I don't know. That, that really stuck with me for some reason. Um, and... In these prayers that I'm going to walk you through to walk us through uh, today, they're pretty close to that. I mean, these are they're not one word, but um, let's see. First one is uh, six words in Greek. Um, the second one is eight words, and the last one is four words. Yeah. So these are, you know, short prayers. And, uh, and yet there could be so much in just a very few words. And of course, I'll have to give you a little context with each one. But, um, but let's start with the first one. So this, was, uh, this is a prayer that actually is a reported prayer. Jesus is telling a parable, and uh, the prayer comes toward the end of the parable there. So the parable is basically that um, a Pharisee, who's you know, one of the religious leaders. So imagine a, a, a pastor or uh, something is in a church and praying like, oh God, thank you that you've given me such a good, th you know, so many good things and you've blessed me and blah, 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 blah. And that I haven't done any of these terrible things, unlike this, you know, tax collector over here. And uh, so th now this is, uh, then it zooms over to the tax collector, and we'll get there in a moment. But first, you got to recognize what a tax collector meant in that context. Um, we're not just talking IRS agent. Now, there's a lot of stories, and we think people don't like the IRS, right? Because they collect money, right? These are the tax collectors. But imagine that and just take it up a few notches, because what's going on here is they're under Roman occupation. The empire is occupying Judah, occupying Samaria, occupying Galilee, and imposing taxes from the emperor. Okay, so when it says tax collector, it also means collaborator. It means this is somebody who's not just collecting taxes for a reasonably benevolent government, right? This is somebody who's collecting taxes on behalf of the oppressive empire. Okay. Now, when you keep that in mind, it might help you to see why tax collectors come up so often. Uh, they get mentioned quite a few times in the Gospels in, in, in negative ways, right? Um, part of the scandal of Zacchaeus Right, the wee little man, the wee little man was he 
uh, the scandal with him isn't that he's short. Like, so what? I mean, he had to climb up a tree so he could see Jesus. Okay, big deal. The scandal with him is that Jesus went to his house and ate with him. That's the scandal. The, the scandal of the, the apostle, Matthew, is that he was a tax collector who left his collaborating, you know, Roman collaborating, tax collecting ways and went to follow Jesus. Um, at one point, Jesus tells tax collectors not to collect more than what is owed to them, more than what is due. And from Zacchaeus' story, we hear at the end of the story, he's like, if I've defrauded anybody, I'm going to pay him back, you know, multiple times what I took. So it's very clear, right? Because what happened was the tax collectors were told, you have to collect X amount of taxes, right? And you go out to the population, you collect the tax. Well, in essence, it was kind of a commission system. You had to collect a little bit more than what the Romans, you know, you collected a little more than what the Romans demanded. Then you pass that along to the Romans and what you, the extra was your own wages. So the way you lived and how well off you were was a direct result and reflection of how, how much you were willing to scam people, basically. I mean, how much are you willing to take? So this is background. Now the Pharisee, the religious leader, the pastor, the the you know the the you know, whatever is up there praying, and then it turns the scene turns to the tax collector who won't even lift up his eyes toward heaven, won't even just won't even do it, is so ashamed and just beats their chest. And says six words in Greek God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's it. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. So you get an address, God. So we know who we're talking to. All right, so it's a prayer. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me, right? Lord, have mercy. This is what right? I use at the beginning of the service, in the prayer time, and now we see it here. Have mercy on me, a sinner. And, the, at the, and by identifying himself as a sinner, the, um, the, uh, the tax collector is basically confessing, I'm a sinner. Right? I have sinned. And Jesus says, who ends up walking out of that, in that case it's a synagogue, who ends up walking out of the synagogue justified that day? Was it the Pharisee or was it that tax collector? And he's like, it was the tax collector. Because he rec the re tax collector recognized his limitations, his sinfulness, and asked for mercy. Right. Now, this theme of mercy is continued in the second prayer that I've got here. And this is from later in Luke's gospel. These first two are both from Luke. This is at the end of, or the end of the gospel. Um, so the context here is Jesus has been nailed to the cross. He's hanging, waiting to die. And then he utters that famous line, Father, Forgive them, but they don't know what they're doing. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. That prayer could be its own sermon, but I only have a little time, so I'm not going to say a lot about it, but maybe another time I'll dig into it deeper. But Father, have forgive them. They know not what they're doing. So again, you have the address to God. Um, in this case, it's pater, the Greek pater, or father, right? Um, this was uh, kind of a, a, a conventional way that Jesus would speak to God, uh, indicating that you know close relationship there, and then said, forgive them. So here he is being painfully, executed as a criminal 
And in the midst of that, doesn't pray for himself, but prays for others. It says, forgive them. Now, who are they? Who is this them? Um, it's specified in the prayer. It's just, you know, autois. That just means them in Greek. Um, forgive them. Well, who is that? Is it the soldiers who just nailed him to the cross or who are piercing him in the side, who are in the last part of the verse drawing lots to die, divide up his clothing? Is it, the, is it Pilate who condemned him to death? Is it the, the religious leaders, the Jewish religious leaders who called for his death? Is it Herod who passed him off to Pilate? Yes, probably all the above. And on a certain level, we read that prayer and we think, is it me? Is it me? Forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Give them for they don't know what they're doing. They don't realize what it is that they're doing here, what they're crucifying. They don't realize who they are killing. They're killing God. They don't know it. Are we part of the them? I mean, it's hard to say, but it does seem likely, right? Forgive them. Well, forgive them. And then there's that last part. For they don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. They live in ignorance, right? They didn't recognize him for who he was. They certainly didn't understand what he talked about. They didn't get the parables. They didn't get the teachings. They didn't understand the miracles. They don't know what they're doing. So often we go through life not knowing what we're doing, right? What he's... Implying here, though, is that even this act of crucifying him, which seems like a very, very clear act, an intentional act on their part, is out of ignorance. Uh, how often do we act out of ignorance? How often do we not have the whole story? Do we not realize what's going on? I mean, all the time, right? So Jesus asks for forgiveness for us because of our limitations. Jesus has mercy on us because we don't know what we're doing. We don't understand the effects that our words, our actions can have. Have you ever been in a relationship and realized that things that you've said that you didn't, you didn't realize were received by the other person with pain. We sin out of our ignorance often, not always, but often. And so the tax collector cries out, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus cries from the cross, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And now come to that third prayer. And this is the last, the last one. And it's really the last prayer of the Bible. Um, doesn't mean I'm ending the series. Don't worry. Um, but it's the second to last verse of the entire Bible. Revelation 22, verse 20. Now, this is at the end of this chapter where you've got the you've you've been having over the last couple chapters the vision of the new Jerusalem come down from heaven. Um, that's a whole other sermon, and actually did a whole series on that a couple of years ago. So if you want to go look back at my Revelation series, unpack that whole book, best I could. But it's coming toward the end of the book, and it's saying things like the spirit and the bride say, "Come." And, you know, there's this whole kind of moving toward the coming of Christ, Christ coming. 
And then it ends with this. It says, the one who bears witness to these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Now, it's interesting because throughout the beginning part of the book, at least, through, I don't know, somewhere in the middle of the book, at least, um, John is the witness. John is the one who is seeing the things and testifying and so on. But here, it seems very clear that it's Christ. It's Christ Jesus who is the witness now. The, and and the, the word in Greek is marturon. It's, mar, it's where we get the word martyr. A martyr is a witness, right? A witness is someone who's witnessing to it. And then a martyr becomes this term, means someone who witnessed to their faith, then was killed. But at this point, it's just a martyr. It's just a, a witness, right? And so it's saying Jesus is a witness to all these things that are happening, right? So he says, yes, I am coming quickly. I'm, I'm on my way, right? Um, and and uh, some commentary, commentaries debate about whether this is a reference to the parousia or the second coming of Christ, the return of Christ, or if it's something else. Um, but it doesn't, in a way, it doesn't almost doesn't matter, right? Because what's happening here is that the prayer, which I'm calling a prayer, which there's, you could debate whether it's really a prayer, but it's a, it's a response what Christ says. Christ says, yes, I am coming soon. And then the prayer is, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. That's it. It's a very short prayer. So the Amen, uh, Amen in the Greek, is a transliteration of the Hebrew Amen, which uh, means like, so be it. Make it so, like, let it happen, let it be. Um, amen, right? It's amen. Um, but it comes from this root that has to do with truth and faithfulness and, and so on. And then the come Lord Jesus. It's very unusual in the New Testament to see a prayer with a command form in it. Come, Lord Jesus, right? Come, Lord Jesus. And in fact, uh, commentaries I was looking at, we're pointing out that the specific form here of this command is one that is not used very often in Scripture. And when it is used, this particular kind of command, it's, it's like in duress. It's like, it's, like the, it's like a crying out, a deep, like desperate cry. Right? Now, if you think about that, the context of the book of Revelation, it makes sense. The book of Revelation is speaking to the early church under a time of persecution, right? Uh, it's why it uses all this coded language, because it's got to go under the radar, right? Because if the Romans find out that that's what they're talking about, they're talking about them, then, you know. But if we talk about the Babylonians, it just sounds like we're talking about history, right? So we'll talk about the Babylonians, but we really mean Rome. Babylonian. Rome. That's what we're talking about. You know it. I know it. Hopefully the Romans won't figure it out. And at least we have plausible deniability. No, no, no. It says Babylon. So these people are under this tight persecution. They're under this situation. And out of that comes this gut, guttural cry. This wrenching, come, come, Lord Jesus, come, make it right, come and change things, come and make it better. He says, "Yes, I'm coming soon." And there, and the 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 response is, "Heck yeah, heck yeah, let's do that." So. In a way, these three prayers uh, can be prayers that we can think about for our in our own prayer life, right? The first one is is prayer of confession. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Right? We ask for God's mercy because we are sinners, we are limited, and so on. We um and then the second prayer is offering forgiveness, 
because Jesus is saying it, it could also be a an asking for forgiveness from from us. So that it kind of goes with that first prayer. So we confess we are creaturely, right? We need your help. And then the last is is just a cry, a cry for God's presence, a cry for Jesus to be with us. What cry comes from your heart today? What cry of limitation? What cry of sin? What cry of forgiveness? What cry for forgiveness? What cry of need? What cry of a need for presence? Let us pray. Come, Lord Jesus, fill us with your presence, your spirit. Help us as we continue to try to be your faithful servants. Amen. And now as we prepare ourselves to come to Christ's table, um, I want to invite us to sing together Spirit of God, descend upon my heart. And uh, this song, um, I, I have such interesting feelings around this song. I love the song. But then there's these parts where it says, like, I ask, no angel visited. I don't need the skies to open. I just need the dimness of my soul to go away. And there are times when I, I look at that song and I want to say, actually, I would like a little bit of something dramatic today. I could use something a little more. So as we sing, you know, prepare yourself, and I will see you at Christ's table. Welcome to Christ's table. At this table, we see the chesed of God, that committed love in tangible form. 
the lengths and depths that God would go to to reach us, to redeem us. On that night so long ago, Jesus took bread and he gave thanks. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam hamotzi lechem min ha'aretz. Blessed are you, Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And he gave it to them saying, take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. Do this to remember me. And then he took a cup, and again he gave thanks. Baruch atah Adonai, lohenu melech haolam, borei puri hagaf, and blessed are you, Lord our God, ruler of the universe, the creator, the fruit of the vine. He gave it to them, saying, drink, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. As often as you do this, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. And I won't drink from the fruit of the vine until I drink it new with you in God's kingdom. The body of Christ broken for us. The blood of Christ shed for us. Thanks be to God for the gifts of God, for the people of God. today is Jesus calls us or the tumult and um, tumult is one of those words that maybe we don't use in everyday parlance uh, but tumult chaos confusion noise right Jesus calls us over that calls us through that to to follow so as we sing, this is our opportunity to commit ourselves and recommit ourselves to the God who calls us from the chaos of life to follow. Not to follow away from it, but to follow through it. So let's sing. As we go into a world that could use some blessing, 
May God be above us to watch over us. May God be beneath us to lift us up. May God be ahead of us to lead us. May God be behind us to push us. May God be beside us to walk with us. May God be within us to love us forever. Amen.